Good day. We're speaking to you from Michigan. Our mission today is to offer you an opportunity to uh, utilize the skill and knowledge that we've accumulated over a period of years to properly employ tactical equipment and material in the field. Our mission is to demonstrate to you how to use the equipment as a normal infantry tactical formation would, with clothing, web gear, armament, and specialized equipment that you may need to tailor to your particular mission. The equipment that I'm wearing right now, for instance, appears to be a mix, and it is. I'm using the PASGAT armor as presently issued to the United States Army, the PASGAT helmet, which comes in five specific sizes, the PASGAT body armor, which is threat level two armor, capable of protecting against most small arms and most fragmentation. I'm wearing a BDU, or battle dress utility uniform. In this case, in this case, the later pattern type tiger stripe, the Mark I, Mark IIA type combat boots issued from the 70s through the early 80s. Boots are essential. One of the things that should be considered as a combat boots are designed for a rugged and a stressful environment. People are trying to kill you. We want to make sure that the equipment works. Everything that we're going to recommend has been tested. Our 23 to 25 layers of laminated Kevlar impressed at about two to 3,000 degrees. It is capable of withstanding 30 caliber rifle rounds directly. Uh, during the invasion of Granada, where this helmet was first deployed, it is capable. It was capable of deflecting three to four direct hits from the 30 caliber AK-47 rifle. It will protect against all types of fragmentation. It is, however, a plastic helmet. Its specific mission is to be used as a helmet. It doesn't have all of the other options that our old M1 uh, steel pot had from both World War II and Korea. It is essential to understand that it is sized. It is in both extra small, small, medium, large, and extra large, and is very specific to the user. This is typical of helmets that were used by the Germans in World War II, and in fact, the design was copied because of the superior protection to the wearer in this area, offering more side cover to the ears and the back of the head, covering the brain. In addition, modification was made to the helmet, allowing for neck movement. And so there is a small dollop in the back of the helmet. Its mission is to allow for comfort. There are, there are a few setbacks to the design. It does not have a rim that deflects water, and so has a tendency to run water or direct water down the back of the neck. Anybody who's been in the woods for a long period of time knows what that creates, discomfort. However, protection is the important issue. It has the capability to protect you quite well. Number two. Pazgat armor. In this case, we're talking about 11 to 15 layers of laminated threat level 2 Kevlar, known as yellow armor. It is capable of protecting against 45 ACP, 9mm, 357, 38 special, all types of shotgun, and some light rifle. Its potential to protect you is obvious. Most casualties during the Vietnam conflict, Vietnam War, correction, were of the neck and head type. An elongated collar has been incorporated with the same number of layers of Kevlar as the body armor itself to protect the vital areas of the throat. The core armor itself is in two large panels following the body and torso, covering approximately to the waist level or belly button level. A second component, which is sometimes available but is rare, is a pair of what we used to call uh, armored underpants. You won't see many people carrying them or wearing them, but if you find them, they're priceless. Average cost usually is $17 to $18 a unit. This Kevlar is very simple and straightforward to use. Velcro closures, and it's open and out. To reissue, or to recontrol it, it's that simple. Seal very quickly. The upper shoulder pads offer protection when the individual is in the prone position. This is obvious because this becomes a weak point and is exposed to small arms fire. Remember, in many cases, the soldier is dug in or in an armored personnel carrier. It needs to be protected more heavily from the chest up. Beyond this point, BDU uniform. Very important to understand, the standard BDU uniform has four upper pockets. The lower part of the uniform has six. Contrary to military policy, any of you out there should be expected to use those pockets. They were put there for a reason. We call them popcorn pockets, and I will give you an example. If you look down at my pants here, 
You will note that I'm carrying all kinds of fascinating things that aren't normally noticed. There's plenty of room for socks, small equipment, pieces, parts, components, and assemblies. Whatever you think you need can be carried here. Normally these are in a 50-50 polyester cotton blend. Come in a variety of camouflage patterns which we will display which are displayed behind me. In addition to that, we also have ripstop material, which is ideal for extreme summer climates or, or tropical environments. This material breathes more efficiently and dries very quickly. The boots themselves are a full protection combat boot, usually in black leather, available through surplus entities of a variety of different types. This particular model was standard from the Vietnam War through to the early part of the 80s. Another boot with speed lace has replaced it. But the important issue is good footwear. Remember, you must protect the flexible parts of the body. You have to have something that will work under all environments. Do not choose for a single weather, weather or climate condition. Example, in most parts of the northern part of the United States, we are in a temperate environment. Going from cold to hot, hot to cold, and back again. Overboots are recommended with these. A rubber overboot, something on the line of what your grandmother used to give you or mom used to give you when you left for school. This will protect you from most of the damage that normally takes place with leather under normal wear and tear. You may only have the boots that you're wearing. Protect them well, take care of them, they take care of you. If a man's feet go, he follows right behind. Beyond this, there are a variety of pieces of equipment that are essential, but you'll notice something that I've done here. A man's rifle is why he's in the field. If you lose your rifle, you are a useless soldier. You are now a hindrance, not a not a, a helpful asset. Because of that, you should instill in all of your participants, individuals or members, that the weapon is never to leave their side, never to leave their hands. They must always know where it is, it must be functional all at all times, and they should be carrying some form of complement of munitions to go with the weapon on their person. Personal arms can also be issued such as handguns, defense shotguns, etc., but they all serve the same mission, to create an individual combatant in the field. As I've mentioned, there are a variety of different camouflage uniforms that are essential to the different environments you may live in. There are several examples laying here that we'd like to note that are readily available through different types of surplus markets, very affordable, very desirable. Number one, I'm wearing the U.S. Tiger Stripe, Vietnam era, and is still used by U.S. SEALs and other Special Forces elements. In addition to that, we have the East German Border Patrol Security Uniform. As you can see, it has a brown raindrop pattern passing through a gray-green material. Next, we have the West German Security Forces, also used during World War II by the uh, Waffen, uh, the uh, Wehrmacht. We also have an example of the earlier style desert pattern with what was called chocolate chips. This is very desirable for urban warfare. and also works exceptionally well during the Northern North American brownout periods. U.S. standard woodland camouflage. This material is available virtually everywhere in the country. It's still a desirable uniform and has become more and more cost effective and affordable as the years have gone by. This particular pattern is Portuguese, and also the Cuban AN2 uniform. As you can see by the surroundings in this particular environment, this uniform is very desirable. It is made in a cotton blend, unfortunately, and normally comes in small sizes. Last, we have another variant on the woodland camouflage located here. This is, this is a U.S. poncho line that is normally issued to Special Forces units and some Marine Corps detachments. Camouflage is essential. In the present battlefield of the 1990s, material and equipment must be protected from conflagration. Because of this, we have to take advantage of virtually every defensive feature that we could conceivably think of. Camouflage affords us a very simple and basic option. Additional features to most of the new uniforms that we're experiencing now include infrared reduction or infrared protection material. Its purpose is to eliminate the possibility of electronic warfare equipment detecting the individuals even in concealed positions. But the important issue is this, the eye. The average civilian and the average soldier is conditioned to patterns. 
In many cases, with most militia units or irregular formations that are in the field, a disruption or a change in pattern is very important. Standardization may actually get you killed. For this reason, we want to ensure that you understand there are a variety of uniforms available, there are a variety of types that can be used, and they should be combined if at all possible. Survivability for your individuals, our first and most important issue, must be maintained. In addition to this, and the best example would be what you see on this PASGAT helmet, are, for instance, camouflaged bands so that you might utilize natural materials such as grass, straw, leaves, branches, to alter the configuration of your uniform when you're moving. The terrain will change, so will the material that your, your camouflage is supposed to blend into. Because of this, you must assist with natural material. You do this by modifying the uniform tucking. You also have different stations on the uniform that can be used to attach different pieces of camouflage material that will enhance your situation. This rubber band that you see on the helmet is designed to take foliage. You've probably seen this in a hundred uh, different military movies, but it should be explained this is essential. These types of items aren't necessarily found growing out here. You have to have them when you acquire the material and equipment that you'll be using. Take an inventory. Assess your needs. Get your person out accordingly. In most cases, the camouflage uniform expenditures, these uniforms will run approximately 15 to $35 a set, as high as 50 depending upon how rare the camouflage is. You have to balance your need accordingly depending upon pocketbook. Remember, if you have more people to equip and arm, you're going to have to select or make a compromise that will put everybody into the proper equipment necessary to maintain them in the field. We have virtually every and any type of climactic environment that you could, you could imagine in the North American continent. Some people will be seeing this training tape will be in the desert. There will obviously be a need for browns, tans, etc. As we live in the northern part of uh, the United States, we experience both the green out that you see in the background, brown, suntan environments with the summer or high summer period, high colors, which would of course allow you to incorporate some of the lighter colors and greens that you see here, and then we move into a fall and then winter period. Because of that, it is a good idea to select a variety of different camouflages for your own personal use, not standardizing on one uniform. An example of this need would be the Yugoslavian conflict that presently exists right now. In watching much of the news footage, you'll note that there's a variety of different uniforms that are being fielded. Part of this is because of the obvious fact that they do not have the resources to buy frontline equipment. Part of it also is dictated by the battlefield, survivability. What works, what doesn't. We have to concern ourselves with practical application. You have no bureaucracy behind you. Your own supply and support is out of this wallet, your pocketbook. Concern yourselves with efficiency. Take advantage of resources. One of the essential items that has to be considered is the fighting load. Fighting load is the infantryman's home away from home. It's carrying all of the essential gear that is necessary to keep him functional in the field. Roughly three days' worth of material and equipment is stored on the combat harness. In this particular configuration that I'm wearing now, this is the M1956 field combat harness. Originally issued in 1956 for the U.S. Army, it's made out of cotton and canvas and is much quieter than many of the new items that are manufactured. We have taken a combination of equipment to make what is a usable fighting load for an individual. Pouches are for the, from the uh, M16 series uh, rifle and material uh, support equipment from the Alice load. Individual uh, first aid kits and items are brought from the M1956 gear. World War II magazine pouch for the uh, 45 ACP, in this case being used for a 9mm pistol. Again, an M16 utility mag pouch. The essential butt pack which is a three-day pack designed to carry three days of both food and munitions to support an individual in the field. It's carrying, uh, in this case, a shelter half, circa 1954 through 56, made for the Army, both a fall and green, uh, green out pattern camouflage. Two canteens are carried per person, and we're also carrying the U.S. entrenching tool. 
It is important to also carry a personal firearm. In this case, the tan shoulder holster would probably be opted for something a little darker, or it would be camouflaged or darkened in in different parts and components so it's less obvious. The fighting load must be tailored and sized to the individual. It must be also considered, other considerations are age, body weight, and the specific mission of the person in the field at the time. Needless to say, if this person or the, the individual you're tailing the gear for would be a medical tech or a radio communications person, his material or equipment would be, would be adjusted or changed accordingly. Priority depends also on whether or not you are talking about garrison personnel or combat personnel. In the situation in Texas with uh, the now, now infamous and famous Waco situation, we would consider those, those troops to be garrison. They were not combat or fighting personnel. They were not prepared to fight a protracted war in the field. Uh, normal militia or National Guard are outfitted as you see here. So they have a standard weapon issued from the U.S. Army, not from the state. They are kitted out for an extended period of time utilizing both a fighting load and a house or what we call a home load, house pack. That's a normal backpack kitted out for an extended period of time carrying all of the other essential items. It should be understood that, again, your combat load must be tailored to the needs of the rifle. If the rifle requires stripper clips, the mag pouches must be accessible to the individual. If the weapon requires magazines, then you would normally have to tailor your magazine pouches accordingly. If the individual is carrying a belt-fed weapon, then he should be carrying the appropriate types of pouches to deal with the types of ammunition that he's carrying, and will norm normally have an assistant gunner. The average militiaman will be carrying an individual firearm, such as the type I'm holding here, the SKS rifle, uh, correction, carbine. It's called a rifle, but in reality it fits into the carbine family as an intermediate defense weapon for specialized troops. It's an all-steel manufactured arm, capable of uh, delivering accurate fire out to 300 meters. It is well manufactured, good steel, good wood. If this weapon doesn't function, if this kit isn't properly tailored to its needs. So again, this is an all an integral system. Camouflage to alter or change the pattern that people are looking for in the field. Camouflage, camouflage, and the support equipment to maintain the weapon. This equipment must also be camouflaged eventually too. We're looking at a normal tactical situation when first being delivered into an environment. Normally this material would also be wound with burlap, covered with camouflage tape at the discretion of the operator and what's available. If all else fails, incorporate natural materials such again as the grass, leaves, trees, branches, whatever. This will change the pattern, reduce reflective surfaces, and allow for something in the form of a more uh, desirable pattern and under uh, in battlefield conditions that's more survival. The weapons themselves also with regard to camouflage, when integrated with the man in the field, should be reduced to the use of burlap, camouflage tape, etc. We've now dismounted the web gear. I'd like to do is review the basic components of the M1956 gear and what are also the basic components, though made out of nylon, for the Alice equipment. In this case, the basic component is a pistol belt, or cartridge belt as it's called. Made in both overseas in the United States, they're fairly cost efficient. Uh, I would prefer OD green, a more neutral color for almost all environments. They come in both large and, and medium. There are no smalls. To start the kit, we adjust the pistol belt for the individual. This is to his waist with clothing fixed, including a jacket if necessary, depending upon weather. The next component which is added are the suspenders. In this case, the M1956 type, made out of canvas. They have an individual keeper which attaches to both components, utilizing hook keepers, which attach to both the butt pack and to other parts of the, of the pistol belt. The suspenders are essential to support the weight of the combat load. They are adjusted by length to the individual. They come in both small, medium, large, and extra large. Extra large is rather difficult to find, small is rather difficult to find. The individual items attached to this are then the butt pack, which is centered in the back of the pistol belt. The 
keepers are then attached from the suspender to the to the butt pack and support most of the weight carried by that. Next, we add the canteens and covers. Standard US canteen. There are a variety of different aftermarket variants. Always carry water. Two quarts minimum should be considered acceptable. If you're willing to carry the weight, four are desirable. If you do not have the money to buy canteens and covers, I highly recommend the 20 ounce or half liter Pepsi or uh, Coke bottles. They're plastic, they cost 10 cents, and they're throwaways. If you're carrying additional water in your backpack or your butt pack, that is a way to carry the water utilizing the plastic containers. When you're done, squash them flat, bury them, and nobody ever know you were there. In addition, this particular canteen is the stainless steel model. Made circa World War II. Stays sterile, easily cleaned, and we have a U.S. issue canteen cup. Canteen cup is one of those essential items in the field for field cooking, field service. They're simple to maintain, easy to use, have a self made handle that's attached, collapses easily, kidney shaped. Will carry a little under a quart of materiel, soup, water, whatever. These canteen cups and the stainless are integral and attach and then store inside the canteen cover. This particular type is a canvas cover. If you're in a hot environment, we'll note that we have a sunny day here, we wish to use natural convection to cool the canteens. We soak the canteen cover in water and then allow for natural convection. The drawing of the cool water away from the canteen actually circulates air, reduces the temperature of the canteen water, in many cases to down around 45, 50 degrees. This is a natural process and it was, it was a design feature with the canteen covers that the military produced. The next step, going to the other side, is the Type 56 shovel cover. <coughs> this allows for the storage of a fighting knife or bayonet on a, about a 70 degree angle to the uh, torso, which allows for easy access. Again, individual fighting knife. This particular one is for the M1 Garand. Very good steel, made it to the zenith of our steel technology. The entrenching tool itself is probably one of the most priceless tools the infantryman carries. During the Vietnam War, it has been stated by the, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese that one of the finest implements left behind by U.S. soldiers was a U.S. entrenching tool. Better made steel, it's a manufactured tool that will last for generations. Many of them are still in service over there. It was this entrenching tool that was used to dig many of the tunnels that were used to conceal guerrilla forces during the war. The shovel is also a weapon. It has two folded stations and is capable of being used when sharpened as a desirable mayhem device, either a chopping device or a stabbing weapon. In many cases, the later models with the wooden handle have a pickaxe, which is also attached to the shovel. In this case, we'll demonstrate. Which allows the shovel to be used both for digging in hard and soft surfaces. Example. On the other side you can see the spike which is used for digging into clay surfaces or rockier areas where you might have greater subsurface rock material. That's desirable when building defensive positions or building up positions of any kind. It is a simple and straightforward item to save your life replacement for the tomahawk of the revolutionary soldiers in the war in the war of 1812 used properly it is priceless again don't lose it somebody else will use it on you going from the shovel and shovel covers we then move forward to the magazine pouches in this case these are the magazine pouch was originally used with the 20 round magazines for the m16 rifle very desirable if they can be found for use with the M1 Durand, uh, the SKS carbine stripper clips, and a variety of other short magazines that are available and on the market right now. These have a simple plastic closer, a squeeze type. 
makes very little noise, allows for easy access. They are a little noisier than the older type 56 cover uh, closers, which were made out of canvas. The M14 magazine pouch, which many people are familiar with in the surplus circles, are easily accessible, cost efficient, and can carry most of the other types of ammunition that we've described, such as the SKS ammunition. In addition, for personal defense weapons, such as the type that I'm carrying in a shoulder holster right now, a small magazine pouch has been incorporated. This is a model 19, uh, 1941-42 pouch. It carries two magazines. There are newer variants that will carry more. Again, canvas. Quieter, cheaper, cost efficient. Individual first aid pouches. Carrying the individual compress. This is an essential and vital first aid item that must be carried by all individuals in the field. It is contained in a canvas pouch, part of the 1956 gear. Another variant on this, which is in a high station on the pouch, where you can carry either the first aid kit or your compass, is made in nylon. It is very obvious the reflective features of the nylon, as opposed to the subdued and natural features of the soft green canvas. Very important. And again, carrying another compress. You really can never carry enough of these. Unlike the Hollywood movies, you can anticipate being injured in a combat, combat environment. With that being the case, we want to make sure we can plug all the holes. Now, beyond these two, on the back of the butt pack, located on the eyelet keepers, which are on the right station of the butt pack itself, we have yet another compress and a small first aid pouch. This can, can also carry, for instance, small surgical items such as a clamp, forceps, tweezers, and scissors. I would highly recommend the use of the clamp. One of the reason, for reasons for this, while a pressure bandage is effective if you have a large medical support system to the rear, if you have a vein that is severed or a bleeder that's bad, it's best to reach in with the forceps, clamp it off, use the compress on top of the clamp. Loss of blood is a... Okay, it's essential to understand loss of blood is a very critical issue in the field. Number one, with militia forces, it is very unlikely you're going to have supply and support in the rear as mentioned before. Because of this, we have to treat the patients immediately. And we have to perform extensive first aid in the field. Other items can be carried, supplemental first aid kits, etc. And attached according to the needs of the individual in the field. Example, we'll now go inside the butt pack. Butt pack. The entire system is attached to a pistol belt. We have individual ammunition pouches stationed around the hips. M1956 shovel cover with an M with a standard entrenching tool, World War II to Vietnam era. Individual fighting knife or bayonet, depending upon the type of weapon system being carried. A minimum of two canteens carried here, either in this station or on both sides of the butt pack. Individual first aid kit attached to the butt pack itself. The butt pack is also carrying individual protection from rain. In this case, a shelter half, but also poncho is carried in this location. The overall rig is an M1956 type, much quieter because it's made of canvas. Individual first aid pouch, individual first aid pouch here, and an individual pouch, magazine pouch for a personal sidearm, such as a pistol or revolver. In this case, a, an automatic two magazine pouch made about 1941-42 by Boyd. The overall kit probably weighs in at about 16 pounds max when loaded with equipment. May weigh as much as 25 pounds. Butt pack was originally designed with the 56 gear as an answer to a need for a device to carry more equipment in the field, keep it lower to the ground to, the, uh, to, to improve the center of gravity for the infantryman in, you know, in, a, in a fighting situation. Lower target. Easier control, better balance. Now in this case, for instance, barrel rolled, though not plastic wrapped and it should be, t-shirts, underpants, socks. For a lot of you, I would highly recommend individual literature that you may not be able to follow up on right now. 
In this case, the Ranger Handbook. With one of these, you can actually train a unit. Squad size, platoon size, whatever. Individual meal components, uh, MREs, meal ready to eat. In this case, we've got a complete MRE. Meal components such as cherry nut cakes, crackers and cheese. Items that you consider fast food, quick and easy to eat. Individual crackers, cocoa powder. Cheese, grape jelly, peanut butter, cocoa. Orange nut cake. Beyond the basic foodstuffs, we'd also normally be carrying other uh, other components that are essential. Spare socks. Some of the civilian foodstuffs that are easily accessible, ramen noodles, quick and easy to use, you find in any commercial store. Rope. In this case, camouflage parachute cord. Rope is a tool. Like your poncho and your shovel, they are priceless in the field. Human beings have a tendency to be very good at improvising, but you need certain components to complete the mission. This is one of those items. Any kind of rope, any kind of, of high tensile strength, low volume string will even work if necessary. Something in the line of what pilots use in their survival kit. Something else which is essential to a lot of fighting soldiers, though it comes in camouflage now, but for years, a small roll of black electrical tape. A lot of the equipment here needs to be silenced. The electrical tape is used to lock the material in place in a flat, subdued color, and will ensure that metallic parts when making contact with each other don't make that characteristic ching, ching, ching in the field. Simple answer, 99 cents a roll. Everybody should carry some. I would also recommend a small roll of 100 mile an hour tape, or what we call duct tape. It's priceless. Many a plane, car, boat, and rifle have been held together with nothing more than some silver tape and a little bit of twine. Once this kit is together, it is a self-contained module designed to keep you functional in the field. You can live out of this by itself. In fact, a lot of soldiers, this is all they carry. In fact, in many cases, less than this was carried. More ammunition was opted for more equipment. This is a discretionary situation. Unlike the regular military forces, most militia and most, most patriot elements do not have a supply and support mechanism to the rear. You have what you carry, and that's all. Because of that, you're going to be out in the field on your own for longer periods of time. You have to rely upon the tools that are with you. We must avoid relying upon some vast supply and support mechanism in the future. Now, underneath, in this case, we have a Type, a type 56 shelter half which we also use for, a, for a rain gear, wrapped around the body and put underneath the field gear. It allows for protection against the elements and also serves as a supplemental camouflage device. Whenever possible, all of your equipment on this kit should at least have two functions, if at all possible. That means you're carrying fewer items, you're going farther with what you've got. Tailoring or adjusting this kit uh, again, depends entirely upon uh, also consumption and capability of the soldier. Where food is concerned, with children and, and older adults and above the age of, say, 45 to 50, I would highly recommend going with freeze-dried foods and lighter foods that are easier to carry. They can end up with the same volume, the same nutritional value, but they aren't carrying the weight in the field, and that is very important. We want to bring everybody through this. You are only as fast as your slowest man. That's your first rule. We leave nobody behind. Because of that, it is the responsibility of the team leader, the platoon leader, the unit commander, to ensure that every man's kit is properly prepared and maintained, and every woman's, and every child's. Because of this, physical inspection is vital. As an individual, as a team leader, as a fire team leader, or as a squad leader, it is your job to physically inspect this equipment. Feel it. Touch it. Check for water. 
Check to make sure that this kid is out where it should be. Make sure that they have proper rain gear and protection. Their life depends on it, and so does yours, because if any component in a team fails to function properly, the team as a whole is reduced in capability. We have to make sure that that doesn't happen. For those of you that are planning and organizing units out there, it is important that this be followed through on. You don't give lip service to something like this. And don't be embarrassed. One of the fascinating things I see is it's a part of that old peer pressure from school is you have to get involved with your people, with the individual components, the working cogs, to make the machine work. Anytime that you have a problem, address it, correct it immediately. If you do not have the resource, you may have to adjust in the field for a shortcoming that, that down the road will cost you a life. We don't want that to happen. Survivability depends upon you. Your innovation, the gray matter between your ears, and your willingness to go farther with more or less. If we don't get paid for this, this is a part of our patriotic duty. The equipment you see here is not unlike the material used by the original Minutemen during their era and every other citizen soldier that we've had in the past that's had to fight an aggressor and protect, to protect and defend the Constitution and Bill of Rights. I will remind you, this can all be adjusted according to your needs, according to your budget. But you must prepare now. You must be properly equipped. We want to see you people through this. As I said before, we leave nobody behind. The next phase that we're going to cover are garrison operations utilizing web gear and security equipment. In this case, we're utilizing the M1, M2 carbine series rifle, 30 round detachable magazine. It is a light weapon by many services considered to be obsolescent or obsolete. In this case, the garrisons, the individual that is part of a garrison has a far different mission from conventional infantry. They're either in that position because of medical needs and or rest and recuperation requirements for elements put to the rear. Because of that, there is a restructuring or re-emphasis on what the individual is doing with his combat harness. The combat infantryman is in a forward, air, forward battle area constantly, in many cases under rustic, a rustic environment or rustic conditions. The garrison soldier's mission, though, is different. He is responding violently and aggressively to a threat to his area of operation. Because of this, his entire web harness is restructured for assault. Volume fire to attack and oppress a, an existing threat. He may be the only response to initially. The M1 carbine is a desirable weapon for this mission and for rear area troops. Number one, it has good volume fire. Utilizing the M1941 magazine pouch attached to a wooden stock in this manner, wrapping around the stock, Two 15-round magazines are carried at the buttstock near the cheek, cheek well of the rifle. A 30-round magazine, Korean era and later, is kept in the weapon at all times. Even if you come out of the shower buck naked and you grab the weapon, you have 60 rounds of ammunition available. That's very desirable. It will get you out of something, or at least will create a diversion to keep people busy while other people respond. And you become a viable part of the fighting team temporarily. In addition to that, the web gear itself, this is the emphasis, is geared or is based on volume fire and replacement magazines. The front pouches are carrying two 15 round magazines each. We have a medical pouch, as you saw in the earlier kit. There are five 30 round stick mags in each pouch, carried on both sides. We're talking 150 rounds per side, plus supplemental ammunition pocket ammunition, remember those big popcorn pockets, that's what they're for in the uniforms. And in addition, additional magazines are carried in pouches in the small of the back. This kit is designed as an assault kit. In garrison, you may be in any one of a number of locations, but again, as a fighting soldier, your mission at different times will be to perform perimeter or area security. This weapon and this kit are tailored for that need. It may vary depending upon the type of weapon. You could be using the Seminoff rifle, the SKS. You could be using the AK-47, the M14, the M1 rifle, the AR-15, or a variety of other weapons. But the mission concept doesn't change. Remember, 
you have to respond violently and quickly to defend your area of operation. The aggressor in many cases would probably be a special warfare type unit or a unit that has exploited a defensive failure on the part of your forces. If all else fails, you are the last line of defense to protect those that you're concerned for. Also, your auxiliary or ancillary personnel, uh, this includes dependents, medical personnel, supply and support personnel, aircraft attendants, you name it, as long as rigor mortis hasn't set in, they may have to become part of your response team. In many cases, they are not your first line personnel. They may have physical restrictions. And for that reason, you tailor their rig to be much lighter and to emphasize defense. The mission behind this will be noted. Individual magazines, in this case a 15 round mag, are easily replaced. It's that simple. They must be easily accessible. Another point, spare magazines, as I said, can be carried in the pockets, upper pockets, and high stations. <clears throat> I will remind you, you never have enough ammunition, you never have enough weapons. Again, I am also carrying a personal firearm. A soldier is useless without his weapon. If at all possible, you will carry both weapons at the same time. There are many arguments, both pro and con, to this practice, but there's a basic rule. You can't share a firearm. In a garrison situation, you may be one of the few people armed in the initial contact. <coughs> there may be other individuals that are, that are within near reach that a personal weapon can be handed to. You now have two firearms engaging the target. This allows for more efficient response, the capability to perhaps dampen or destroy the potential of an aggressor to perform an offensive action or continue an offensive action. Maybe the difference between life and death. The M1 is conducive to a uh, rear area operative because of its light weight, ease of maintenance, and potential use. It's that simple and it's loaded. Point it towards the enemy and put some bullets down range. The SKS has a similar mission when need be. It was originally designed for the Russian Army as, a, uh, as an auxiliary rifle for use by the artillery, uh, armor units, medical support, etc. It became a main battle rifle for the Communist Chinese uh, because of shortcomings on the part of their manufacturing capabilities. And it was tested in battle. You'll note that I'm not necessarily wearing my body armor, but I am wearing my helmet. I can't replace most of the parts that are between my ears here if I get caught with a 30 round. For that reason, I want to make sure that I'm as well protected as I possibly can be while still not encumbering myself during my other activities inside a garrison or compound. Response teams will probably be selected to support you wherever you make contact with an aggressor. These support teams will be five to ten men designated for that particular day or for a set period of time whose mission will be to be on call to respond to a threat, but they must first know that the threat exists. It is your mission to make contact initially with the enemy, depending upon where you are within the garrison or the compound, signal to supporting personnel that you have you've made contact, and then appropriate personnel are deployed against the threat. Remember, your weapon's your best friend. Keep it with you. Garrison forces normally in position, if they are not carrying the heavier combat harness or they've standardized on other weapons, may imp implement some of the foreign equipment that's available to us right now. This is a, an SKS chest pouch carrying approximately 200 rounds of ammunition in stripper clips. Looks a little complicated, but it's really not all that difficult. I'm going to mount it over the chest, down behind me. I have tie straps. It's now in place. Each one of these pouches carries two 10 round stripper clips carrying any type of ammunition desirable for the SKS soft point, hollow point, armor piercing. The last pouch is carrying a spare parts kit, which includes all of the basic components to maintain the SKS in the field. Firing pin, extractor, ejector, all minor springs, a basic cleaning kit, and an oil bottle. So this kit is self-contained. Now, when carried with the Seminoff with the SKS, 
The man can move comfortably inside the garrison or any site, or for that matter, even as a light combat soldier, as an auxiliary, and he's carrying everything that he needs in the field for basic engagement. 200 rounds of combat ammunition. Remember, we have our popcorn pouches here, so you can carry more ammunition in individual pockets. This rifle itself is 10 shot magazine capacity. The advantage, the way the rifle is set up, is that in opening one of these pouches, you extract an individual stripper clip, mold the stripper clip, it's loaded that easily. This weapon is now fully functional. Upon pulling the bolt back, the first round is loaded into the chamber. I have 200 rounds of ammunition that can be loaded that easily. This is a very desirable system, especially for defense forces. To deactivate the rifle without loading, I need to do nothing more. Drop the ammunition out the bottom of the weapon. Very simple. The rifle, again, kiss, keep it simple, stupid. We like this system. Drop it in my pocket, very convenient, it holds everything. And what I have is an independent weapon system. Cost on these pouches anywhere from three to five dollars a piece. Cost on the rifle anywhere from as little as eighty to as much as one hundred and fifty dollars for variants on this system. Ammunition anywhere from ninety-five to one hundred and fifty dollars a case for anywhere from eleven hundred to fifteen hundred rounds. Awfully nice thing to have and put in somebody's hands, especially if you have a lot of people to arm and not much money to do it with. All steel construction. A good garrison rifle. Several of these can be stored on site. If somebody comes buck naked, running from some type of situation where they've been threatened or engaged, you can reissue this particular weapon along with a chest pouch, minimal amount of equipment, minimal expense. Put this person in the field. You'll note the convenience. Very simple. Toggle connectors. Some may have a simple tie string, similar to the tie back that I have. It is canvas, very quiet, very comfortable. In addition, this can be worn under the standard web gear that is presently used that was demonstrated earlier, the Type 1956 and or the Alice rigs. This can be used as your primary web gear for ancillary or auxiliary personnel, along with a backpack or what we call the house load. Carry the rest of your equipment. Kiss. Keep... Okay. What we have here is a basic rear area combatant, in some cases youth, uh, or garrison uh, soldiers. Uh, the individual is kitted out with the East German splinter pattern uniform, East German combat harness, utilizing the AK-47, Norwegian uh, steel helmet with U.S. cover, elasticized camouflage band, as you've seen before. In addition, we're supplementing with uh, surplus combat boots from the EEC, He's utilizing the teardrop backpack commercially available. This kit is cost efficient, lightweight, capable of supporting the individual for an indefinite period of time in the field. He has reasonable armor protection. He's utilizing the spandiflage camouflage available commercially. It can also camouflage and reduce the silhouette and symbols with the hands. On his right, below the elbow, is an AK-47 4 magazine mag pouch, coordinated in the same material as the uniform itself. The capabilities of this individual are comparable to any standard fighting soldier on the planet today. Cost efficient though, total expenditure for this individual, approximately $45. Cost of the weapon varies depending upon your, your purse and expenditures available. He is capable of moving with the same efficiency and defending as effectively as any of his adult counterparts. And, of course, is gaining knowledge and experience as a militia member that eventually he will bring to full fruit and fruition once he comes of age. It is important to note that all of our family members and individuals should be kitted out appropriately and capable of taking our place should we fall. The militia is an integrated part of the population in general, not isolated elite forces, but the population as a whole. This is very important to remember. Modifications to the camouflage can enhance its potential. Uh, again, foliage added to the sweatband. Camouflage can be tucked into, or foliage can be tucked into the harness and gear. Bands can be attached and tied to the uniform. 
The pack itself is camouflage. In most cases, you will find these commercial packs are offered in a variety of different types of camouflage. Whenever possible, take advantage, since it costs the same for green as it does for any type of pattern, take a pattern. Again, you're disrupting the overall image and view. This particular pack is carrying individual medical gear in the back. Accessible inside the pouch are a, are a poncho liner and poncho. Another poncho separately set up for rain gear. Three MREs, individual meal components for uh, snacks and for uh, food breaks on the march. A 20 ounce uh, bottle of plastic, uh, disposable, 10 cents a unit. And a variety of other food and individual and personal items that are needed to support the individual, including that all and ever essential toilet paper. One of the things everybody seems to forget is burdock gets rather dull after a while. Corn cobs are a little rough. When you can, supplement the equipment that you have in the pack with material that you can find from your home. You get down the end of that toilet paper uh, in the bathroom, take the short rolls off, squash them flat, put them in a baggie, put them in this backpack. It'll make a world of difference two or three weeks into a, into a field operation. Trust us. Again, cost efficient. The uniform is desirable for almost all seasons. The splinter pattern uh, takes advantage of the small pattern camouflage. As we've seen in earlier footage, we have a variety of different camouflages to draw from. The cost in this uniform for this individual was a total of $8 new. That is very, very desirable when you consider that most people can't afford to outfit complete components because they do not have sufficient resources and materiel. The rifle, in this case an AK-47, is effective out to 300 yards, uses both 30-round magazines and 75 and 100-round drums, is capable of a cyclic rate semi-automatic of approximately 45 rounds per minute. We desire accuracy. Volume fire is only used in an emergency, and we prefer that you hit a target once rather than miss it 200 times and claim that you burned a lot of ammunition. How much can you carry? Additional equipment can be attached to the web gear, supplemental, such as medical support items, and in many cases, your rear area and support personnel will normally be implemented for evacuation or security during evacuation operations, garrison duty, patrol and operations around garrisons, etc. One of the most important issues is body armor. In most cases, the units that are involved cannot afford to purchase it. Cost-effective items that can be implemented are used to supplement frontline equipment. Body armor is also accessible for the younger individuals and for the women, female population. This is very desirable. As again I have stated in the past, we take everybody in the future. We leave nobody behind. The next phase in consideration should be medical support items. As again, our concern is to bring person out of the field intact. There are a variety of things that are needed to support an individual casualty, be this an automotive accident, firearms injuries, any kind of natural disaster that might take place. Several variations on this that are available. In this case, this is a platoon leader's first aid kit. One of, one of the better supported and supplied items that we have found that's on the market. There are better that are commercially made that are professional. It is a volume device. This particular kit is carried as a shoulder bag, contains some simple first aid instructions, and a good combination of everything from 4x4 bandages, individual compresses, gauze, forceps, band-aids, cold compress, you name it, it's here. One of the advantages and the desired, the desired effects is that you will have volume in the field. We're not treating with a band-aid. You may have to maintain a casualty for a long period of time, long as in maybe one to three days before you can receive proper medical attention. Can you do so? Well, you can, but first you need the proper tools. The two liters first aid can actually be carried by almost every individual if you can anticipate, for instance, uh, an upcoming action. This particular device runs about $9.50 to $10 a unit. It's readily available in good numbers, and I would consider one of the first choices as an individual item within each fire team or squad. Individual support and protection includes such items as the medium compress, which is approximately 11 and 3 quarter inches square by the time you're finished. This would cover uh, desired injury, undesired injuries such as uh, shotgun wounds, 
uh, lacerations from glass or fragmentation. Where several smaller bandages might be necessary, this covers an entire area. It should be carried by each individual, by the way, if at all possible. Of course, we also have the individual compress first aid dressing. These are both sterile. This one is carried in the individual station above, on the pistol belt, and also on the butt pack. It is used as a compress modifier. If you have a laceration, a cut, eye injury, whatever, and you have bleeding, you open the pack, apply the bandage, maintaining pressure, and then fix the bandage into place with wings, butterfly wings approximately two feet long, that tie over the wound. This is your first option with an injury. This is the next place to go if it's big enough that you don't think this is going to handle it. Highly recommended that at least three of these are carried per person. Two is considered minimal. One per person. And of course the aidman carries anywhere from 10 to 12 of these in his individual first aid kit. Going to a more sophisticated kit. This is a tri-fold emergency pack. The first pouch is carrying an individual medium several different types of compresses, triangular folds, etc. The center pouch is carrying individual medication, carries uh, everything from cough lo lozenges to uh, feminine protection devices. Now, that may sound funny, but if you don't have enough compresses that you can carry, we can be carefree. What I mean by that, this is used also by EMTs and many and many ambulances, you will never carry enough if you have extreme trauma patients to deal with all the casualties. These are lightweight, they're small, they can be easily applied, and they can be they can be stationed accordingly. Cheap, easy, and light, and they're thin. These supplement these. They're still not the best choice, but they're a choice. Take your take your pick of brands, we're not too particular. In addition to that. We have a variety of surgical items that are available. There is a small surgical pack located in the largest chamber. I'll give you an example, again, the all-important clamp and forcep. If you have a bleeder, small vein, even an artery, I take my chances with an artery, reach in, clamp it off. It is important that you stop the bleeding as quickly as possible. Allow for the fact that you may not have intravenous feed to supplement the body's loss of fluids. Another important thing, plastic gloves, and they don't necessarily have to be sterile, but you must be carrying them, and all individuals should. Within your own personal groups, you may have a good, reliable record of the blood supply that you're going to be involved with. But being involved with other individuals in the country, there is the possibility of coming in contact with highly communicable diseases. Protect yourself now so that we don't have to worry later. Another important thing, thermal blankets. It is recommended that each individual carry one of these as a solar blanket, very popular with a lot of emergency and crash units. This particular device, called the survival blanket, has been manufactured by Rothko, is to be used to help treat for shock. Remember, we're going to stop the bleeding, treat for shock, evac the patient, take care of the problem, the injury. When you are treating a casualty, in many cases, the individual unit will have a pre-designated point for this equipment. Use the casualties equipment first. Do not use frontline medical equipment until you have expended the material that the individual is carrying. This way, you will not lose material that is leaving the battlefield with a casualty. Think about it. You use your equipment, and you're the next one hit. Now, we have a resource problem. And we may not necessarily be able to treat the individual properly. Another simple device, in this case, gauze, sterile fields, and pads. Five and dime stores, medical support facilities, pharmacies all carry them. You will need quantities, not a little, a lot. And as many as you can afford, cheaper is better by volume. Another device, an item that is very important, very desirable, air splints. Cheap and easy. Fastest way. We've all been trained Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts and with first aid how to fabricate splints. But an air splint's awfully cheap, saves a lot of misery, is fairly clean, 
and can be left in place for an extended period of time. Okay, very desirable, costs anywhere from as little as $2 a unit to as high as $16 a unit for the Cadillacs of Airs Plumes. These are one of the primary items that should be in here. In addition to that, sounds strange, I would expect to see a cup of soup in here. Small eating items. I device uh, in ways that these are items that are used to, uh, shall we say, induce the taking of fluids where it might not otherwise be possible. Uh, also for medication support. Pain relievers. All types, any types, whatever you can afford. Me uh, medications such as generic Tylenol, aspirin, Tylenol 3 if it's accessible. Whatever types of painkillers you can access, that's a, pre that's a personal uh, resource problem that can't necessarily be addressed by outside sources. You have to be innovative. This particular kit is a little more extensive, costs quite a bit more money, but there should be one in every squad at least, preferably two, one for each fire team. This individual kit folds up. It's convenient to carry. It's that simple. It can also be carried, of course, over the shoulder in a better fixed position and is accessible to the corpsman. Upon being necessary to be used, access that simple. Material can be drawn out of the pouch as needed while you're working on a casualty. You do not even have to take the kit off. Very important because you don't have time to worry about this. Man's got an arm laying open, and you see, boop, 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 boop. you're going to be more worried about how much fluid's going out here than whether or not you look good. You can access it. Again, you'll never have enough medical support. I'll emphasize small compresses. In this case, these are made by Johnson & Johnson. A medium compress. A platoon leader's first aid kit or any type of first aid kit that you can fabricate, and if every individual can carry one, that would be recommended, up to and including minor surgical kits. This is a matter of life and death. Support your people properly. They'll support you. One of our most common concerns is with dependents and non-combatants in the environment that we're preparing for. For this reason, We've taken the secondary and ancillary equipment or older equipment and incorporated it into use so that they have all the material necessary to stay in the field. They're not rigged for combat use, but they are rigged for survival, escape, and evasion. Earlier lighter suspenders or small suspenders are used to keep up a, an, an inexpensive pistol belt. And as we turn, we'll see that we have the compress pouch and the compress pouch located where they normally would be in a combat harness. As we turn around, M16 magazine pouch, which is being used as a utility cargo carrier. It can carry food, equipment, uh, a small survival blanket, and other components such as matches, lenses, knives, etc. Standard canteen cover, in this case with, or canteen cover with canteen and, can, and canteen uh, cup, allow for uh, water carrying and other supplemental items can be carried here to uh, deal with water water transportability. Remember the 20 ounce uh, plastic pop bottles can also be used for younger children still who can't carry as much weight. As we turn around a little farther, you will note that we have other utility pouches that are normally of aftermarket for manufacture. Easy access is essential with the children. Remember, child or family members may become separated from you during any type of situation and the child must be able to access and utilize the material and equipment that they are carrying. They must be able to use it. Everything must maintain the KISS system again. As we turn around, you'll note that everything is accessible to the individual. In addition to this, we might find a backpack of the teardrop type, as was demonstrated earlier. The backpack will carry supplemental food, additional equipment, will carry cold weather gear, uh, change of clothing, the objective behind this is that the parent will be safe in the knowledge that the individual person, the child, will have everything necessary to support himself, even if separated from the family. With standard operating procedures, SOP, designated and instructed, all individuals will know that the child or children, if separated, and dependents, will be able to stop, 
protect themselves from the elements, feed themselves, and maintain themselves for a period of time. This helps to reduce the stress and tension problem with those people who are responsible for the youth. Other equipment varies depending upon availability. In this case, we're using just a, a standard surplus hat. Number one, it offers good protection. Has uh, ear flaps built into it for cold weather. Supplemental clothing will vary depending upon availability. But it is important to remember and understand that this is cost efficient again. We want to make sure that the person is prepared, it's affordable and within budget, and allows for this person to familiarize themselves and grow up into the militia mechanism to understand how it works. We do not exclude anybody, and that is one of the most important issues. Again, as uh, our young assistant here will demonstrate, he can get into the pouches, accessing all of them. In this case, we have individual meal rations. We have a survival blanket located in this pouch. The smaller external pouches may carry that all and ever important toilet paper, as we've mentioned many times before. Fire starters, matches, etc. also carry. Local powder. You'll see other individual items. Varies depending upon the type of kit set up by the person. Remember again, exclude no one. Prepare for the worst and we won't be disappointed. In this case, it also reduces the stress to the children for they're as well prepared as you and I are and are capable of...